All right, thanks everyone. Uh, so we have a little bit of a change from our agenda on our next panel. John Lanhard was unfortunately uh, not able to join us today because of an illness in the family. Uh, but luckily we have a great room of TPP graduates that we can pull from and we found a, a great TPP graduate to, uh, to actually to chair our panel. Um, and Ken Strespack has volunteered to uh, give a more um, a more thorough presentation as a member of the panel. Um, our chair is Ambuj Sagar. Uh, he is professor of policy studies at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Uh, his interests are on S&T policy, environmental policy, development policy, with a particular focus on interactions between technology and society. And he did both the TPP program and his PhD at MIT. Uh, so welcome, Ambuj. Um, thank you very much, Noel. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be a pinch hitter, so to speak, uh, and kind of help uh, work with my colleagues on this panel on technology development and sustainability, which is uh, certainly issues that are close to my heart and uh, stuff that I work on myself. Uh, but we do have two really, uh, I think, very uh, eminently qualified panelists here to um, explore various dimensions of this, of this issue. Um, before I get to that, I want to just kind of preface that with a few comments as to why I think, I think uh, this is a particularly important uh, panel for this uh, discussion that especially as we think about the future of TPP uh, and also I think given where the state of the world is. I think in a sense the, the title of the panel itself points in that direction I think given uh, today's world questions of both uh, relating to development and sustainability are more and more center stage. Uh, I think they've always been there, but I think now they've become more prominent. And it's pretty clear that any program that is thinking about technology or policy, or in this case, technology and policy, has to uh, more and more think about these questions. And in, in some sense, I think this goes back to the question that was posed at the end of the last panel about the future of TPP. I do think that this panel is hopefully is going to provide some guidance on uh, how uh, a program such as TPP might engage with the major uh, developmental and sustainability challenges facing uh, uh, most, most, most of the world. Uh, I, I just want to talk about the fact what's common between these two challenges in a manner of speaking. Uh, I think certainly some of the points that I were put up earlier in terms of uh, some of the characteristics of grand challenges, uh, especially the, the notions of scale, complexity, and timelines. Uh, these are big challenges, these are complex challenges, and we'd like to address these challenges in as short a time as possible. Um, uh, and I think both of them really, uh, development and sustainability, both of them really, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, very, very much kind of exemplify these, these challenges. Uh, but of course, the question, especially when we put up the, uh, the, the notion of development uh, and that uh, brings in the context of developing countries, and people talked about the importance of context in thinking about policy making. The constraints uh, faced by developing countries, whether they're economic, human, or institutional, pose another layer of complexity on thinking about how to engage with these kind of questions. So I think how to navigate this terrain is, is, is of development and sustainability, where technology turns out to be an important tool, is uh, I think, uh, as, as we are all beginning to recognize, is, is, is really important today. Uh, and the last point I think I want to make is, especially for a, for a group such as this, where things thinking about policy, both in development area and sustainability, policy makes plays a really important role. Because the market, in a sense, doesn't work very well, uh, policy, and we are talking about public goods, policy is really very, very critical. So I think that actually sets up, sets up really well to think about, about these questions. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with um, uh, Ken Stresbeck, who is um, uh, an engineer and an economist who's uh, worked on a number of different areas, but particularly relating to water resource planning and water resources systems, uh, but also to some extent agricultural questions. Um, so uh, we'll uh, start with Ken, who is going to make a few comments, and then uh, we'll come to the next speaker after that. Thanks. Over to you, Ken. Oops. Excuse me. So I'm gonna use a few slides here and uh, so people are wondering, what is this difference between 1975 and 1976 for TPP? Well, I graduated as an undergraduate in civil engineering in 75. And what happened is Richard, I wanted to go in the program, and Richard said no. 
So we're going to wait one year. So then I could go and join Dave Marks. And I got an education in TPP, which was personal. One of the things that you, I think we, we can't underestimate, we can develop programs and make, make up um, schedules on how we're going to do things, but it's the people that make it. I've been in departments, we've got all the right athletes and all the right people, but it doesn't do interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary research. And we heard that about Carnegie Mellon and what's happening there, and it was that collegiality. And, and you'll see at the end, I think some of the features are more about personality than about professionalism or, or academics that make things work together. So um, what I want to do uh, today is talk a little bit about it. And, and from the bottom, you, you see right now I'm involved in a couple things across the red line, uh, working at Tufts and at, at the Kennedy School and that here at MIT. And, and I'm doing some of this across multiple campuses. It's still closer than some of the Big Ten schools where you have to get away far away to do that. And, and we're going to be looking at these uh, questions for the next 40 years. And there were, were a number of questions that we were asked um, to look at as, as we move forward. And, and the first one was related to the domain and what we may have to do related to that domain. And one of the things is MIT is trying to move in that direction and looking across um, technology, um, development and sustainability, and one is, and, and John could not be here today, but uh, John has started um, leading this new uh, lab, which is the Jumia Lab for the World Water and Food Security Lab, which is trying to look at these issues across the campus and bring these together um, from a research um, perspective. So the, the campus is trying to move that way, and it is one of the highlights on the development program. So the, the administration sees those domain uh, across this area as something that's really important. But when I talk about technology today, I'm going to really kind of look at the area of infrastructure as my technology, large civil systems, water, energy, uh, and food as, as we look at this rather than the more manufacturing or other things to look at this. And, and one of the things that we do see is the, the whole area of development in infrastructure is coming back into the fore. There was a big debate in the past amongst economists, is it push or pull? But it's coming forward that it, it's a combination and depending on, on the area, but that we really need a lot to do. And, and Amati Sen, in some of his recent work, has really been pushing this notion that we need infrastructure to help in development. And so one of the things about infrastructure, and as a civil engineer, we, we get called a lot of bad names. If, that's why I like to be more an economist. Because um, engineers, we pour concrete, and we destroy rivers, and we build bridges, and we do things. And unless you're Jim Westcote, um, where you work on putting in beautiful highways through a beautiful Colorado and at the most expensive per kilometer of the interstate, um, we don't usually have that money. So we're, we're making ugly systems. How do, we, how do we bring that apart? And while talking about Jim um, Westcote, um, I get all my degrees from, from, from this place, as I mentioned. Um, and w there was a shortage in my education. And it was real. One day, I had a graduate student named David Yates, who's now at NCAR doing TPP. And he says to me, is he spelled like the poet? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he's not. He's spelled the other way, which showed my lack of, of education here um, at MIT and humanities was taking economics. So um, now, the other thing that, uh, that, that Sen said in the, the I like to go to parties. Last year, I was at the 30th anniversary of WIDER, the World Institute for Development Economics Research. And Joe Stiglitz and, and Amati Sen spoke. Um, and what he said is he sees the challenge of sustainability and development, climate change hitting it right in the teeth. And, and that's some of the things that we're going to try to talk about today is if we look at this issue of technology, then we have development. But technology is science, too. As we get to the bigger issues, it's not just the engineering, but the technology is the science side of how we're dealing with natural sciences and what is its impact um, on us as we deal with food and some of these other areas. So at the World Institute for Development Economics Research, as they look to the future, and this was six years ago, they started a program on development under climate change. Because they saw this, as Amati Sen pointed out, as a real issue and a threat to development. Because on both sides, the mitigation is energy is such an important infrastructure in development. How is energy policy going to affect development? And then on the other side is 
most, as we look at it, the most vulnerable are those who are trying to develop to climate change. And what is this two-edged sword going to do on development, and how do we respond to that? And it's addressing some of the things that are in the questions that, that were asked today. So one of these questions are related to methodologies. And so what happened at, at WIDER is they developed a program and a new methodology called SACRED. Um, and this was Systematic Analysis of Climate Resilient Development. So a word that drives me crazy, which some policymakers use, is climate proofing. Okay. So you can't climate proof something. And the other big issue is we can't have, um, we, we look at climate change and people are forgetting about the current variability in the climate. So it's not just change, it's variability. And that variability that, that's been here with now, we are not doing a good job with that, with that in development as well because of some of the issues that are there and facing the risks. So Wider developed this tool and they realized, the economist there is that the biophysical processes that led from climate all the way to GDP needed to be modeled and addressed systematically. And so they put together, and it was the first time non-economists, but because I had a master's, they let me in, non-economists were funded at WIDER. They've had some other social scientists, but um, engineers were not, were not brought in. And we developed this framework called, called SACRED, which was to look at the energy, food, water and excess in development and how they related. And one of the things that came out of this work is one of the biggest threats to development in the future is flooding. We think it's drought, but if we have a drought, we can bring in food. If we have a flood, we destroy the capital. And so we have to rebuild that capital as well as having an impact on that year. So the, the, the flood in Mozambique in 2001 um, caused a 4% 4, 4 drop in GDP that year alone, and it took them five years to catch up to where they were. So what we're seeing in climate science is these extremes, and we have to focus now, the message back is we have to focus in looking on extremes and also looking at the wet as well as the dry. The other thing that came out here is look at this list of people that were involved in this project, and I was the coordinator of this. So I was able to be involved because I was bilingual, having a degree in economics as well as engineering, I could talk across that. And the other policy issue is the person who asked this question in South Africa was the Ministry of Finance that wanted to know where to put their funds and also should they have a carbon tax. So we're working on a couple of different aspects related to that. So we went from civil engineers, we had a social scientists, and we really had to work across these disciplines. And we heard it earlier just a few minutes ago, across scale. Water you have to deal with at the river basin scale. If you average the water of the United States, we have no problem. Boston's water goes to San Diego, no problem. How do we model it at the right scale? But if we're doing economics at the national level, which is appropriate, we don't want to put water where there is no water. So we had to learn how to do that. Time scales, economic models running every year, floods happen daily. Water supply happens monthly. How do we work these together and how do we deal with the economic systems of, of policy making and water rights and how does that all work together? So we had to work a lot on that and I'll give you some of the lessons we learned at the end. But again, it was across these disciplines. But the key thing is we couldn't just throw everybody in a room. We had to work and cross through it. As we look to the, to the next question is um, we wanted to look at issues related to both mitigation and adaptation. So one of the big things, and this is work of Jake Jacoby at the uh, Joint Program for um, Science and Policy of Global Change, is when we look at post-Paris, there is this big, big amount there in red that we have to get to, to to meet our targets. And so if we look at here, we see where Paris is, we have to get below Paris to get to the two degree limit. We're maybe at 3.5 depending on who, who you think about. And as you look at this, this slide shows that the biggest people that have to work on this are India and Africa. So what I want to look at now is, so Wider is interested, what does this then mean for Africa if we have to um, reduce the carbon emissions, why it's trying to develop? And we all know that the importance of electrical energy and electricity in, in development. So, when we look at the issue of food security, which is one of the issues we look at, um, food security, a threat to it is energy policy. And, and how could that be? 
Well, Africa set up the green energy um, corridor, which is to connect the energy tower. So the, uh, Ethiopia has almost 60,000 megawatts of potential hydropower. The, the Congo River has one plant alone that can have 40,000 megawatts of electricity, which is the um, Grand Inga project. And the Zambezi Basin, which is right above um, South Africa, has about 18,000 megawatts of um, energy that could be developed. And the reality is we see development needs energy. So as we look at this and we look at South Africa, if you take an economic modeling approach, which is uh, what happened here, when we use energy planning models, the cheapest thing is for South Africa to burn their own in Mozambique's coal. A coal-fired power plant in South Africa is about $800 a megawatt. Hydropower is $3,000. It's very expensive, and renewables are expensive. This is what the development would look like. If they put in a carbon tax to try to meet some of their standards, we get this. And fortunately, we have a nuclear expert here who can help us with That's nuclear that fills that gap. And do we want to, right now, there's plans for six nuclear power plants going to South Africa. Is that something they, they want to do? And there's a huge debate in South Africa. The alternative is this, to go to hydro. So that seems really good. But none of that green is in South Africa. The rest of that green is mainly in Zambezi. And some of it's all the way up in the Congo, um, 10,000 kilometers away, that we have to get electricity down there um, through Botswana, Angola, uh, Zambia, not, not very stable um, environments. So what happens is we go look at what's going on in the Zambezi. And this is a study um, that was done by the, the World Bank and the Zambezi River Authority on um, using, of all things, a tool that Dave Marks helped to lead called, this is the child of Mitzim, that was used to do this analysis on simulation. So um, this analysis shows the Pareto curve is to go for foods. You can see it here. On, I got to be two fisted. I'll point both ways. But up in the upper upper corner, that's the Pareto knee where we're trying to get as much irrigation as we can, which is along the x-axis, and the the y-axis is energy. So they were focusing on that area that's bright, and that was the solution before the green energy corridor came in. Is we would try to get as much irrigation, food security, which also leads to more jobs. Um, and go to that sector. But the red arrow now is where they're being pushed to because they want to have as much green energy as they can. So that's a significant trade-off between food and energy. How can we work in that, that sphere? So this is the issues that are incredibly complex that needs all of the kind of things that we're doing here. So looking at energy policy and food policy need to be taking on the skills that are being taught at TPP and in the research. And in the research, there's this key. These are issues that have not been addressed yet. It's a, I'm going to use that bad word, applied research. It's bringing people together with existing techniques, but putting them in a way to answer a question in a different way. So at the same time, what is the threat of climate change to developing this green energy? And this was a study. OK. This was a study that was done by the World Bank that shows the future, the, the straight line is, is current energy generation in Zambezi. And the other is, given all the uncertainty of the future, what we're going to lose. So one of the things to look at is whether we should do um, flexible design. So some of the concepts that Richard has come up uh, with this book are being put into put play is, can we develop these systems under flexible systems? So these are some of the, the techniques and the results that came out of this wonderful study. And but what we found out is that there was a development partner from Europe. And you may be able to guess after the last panel what country these people came from that gave these comments. But that what was done was too complex. That what needed to be given out were results that were very simple and easy to use. The, the issue is one of the most complex development issues out there. And they didn't like the results because they were too complex. So, how do we communicate this? And I think just want to lead it to um, one of the things that are out there is this complex issue of how do we communicate our results? Well, I think we, there's an example not far from here from the joint program where they worked on this large scale global emissions. And these are the results of Mort Webster's PhD, which are CDFs and PDFs. And it was found that this was too complex for many. And our colleagues in the UK might have said the same thing. 
So what the scientists did is came up with this to communicate. That communicates the exact same thing, is each of those wheels are two different climate policies. Um, the one on the left is a climate policy of um, unconstrained emissions. On the right is um, level one, or about 450 parts per million. And so the colors are the probabilities of being in certain temperatures. And if you look, that it's almost all blue on the right and almost very little blue on the left, which was communicating the risk that we have. In the so people understood this. So this communicating, taking something, and this last one is from the Papal Journal of Climate, and this is from presentations given to policymakers and decision makers on energy. So we have to learn how to communicate our results, which are really important. So as we look at what are the challenges for the next 40 years, what's our research priorities? I really think communicating risk across disciplines. How do we communicate risk? And as we go forward, the last thing is to think differently how we do our research at the graduate level and whether, like we heard at UCL, not horses for courses rather than one thing for all, all futures. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, next, we have uh, Adil Najam, who is um, an old friend. Also an engineer? And you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed and I said engineer. Yeah. Um, um, but after, after doing his undergraduate engineering, he actually has been working on questions of environment and develop, development policy now for over 20 years, or maybe 25 years, and uh, really is one of the leading thinkers uh, in the developing world on, on many of these questions. So, over to you, Adil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambuj. Uh, wonderful, wonderful to be here. Ambuj and I go back to TPP, actually. Uh, this, this is yeah. where we first met. We were at TPP around the same time. I'm going to pick up uh, from where Ken left, but, but maybe in a slightly different, uh, different uh, fashion uh, on the issue of climate change. Uh, but before I do that, if, if, uh, if Manzar and Noor will allow me, I, I do need to make a personal, and I know this has been done officially before, but I really need to personally thank uh, Richard Dunofel, uh, on, 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 on behalf of all of us, including those who are not here, for not ha only having created, but crafting uh, this program that has really created a generation of people uh, who have thought about these issues very, very differently. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess I should also thank Richard for having granted me admission but refusing me any financial aid, <laughs> uh, which, which, which gave me the good fortune, you two. <laughs> Maybe you should get a show of hands to all the people who that happened to. But in my case, it, 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 it led to the good fortune of, of me um, uh, being told by Richard, go and, and drop your CV in every, under every door you can and, and ask for money. There's plenty of money floating around this campus. Uh, and, and I did that. And that that allowed me uh, to, uh, to 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 knock on the door of Dave Marx, who was the first one uh, to have funded me, and then then uh, uh, here at uh, here at um, MIT, which was which was again wonderful. And thank you for that, Dave. Uh, I, I want to I, I, I want to talk about climate change, uh, but as I said, maybe given who is in the room and given the wisdom and the experience that is gathered here, uh, to try to tell the story and maybe then hear the story from you of climate change as told by science, technology, and policy. And I've been struggling with this the last two or three days. Uh, I, I have um, been part, a very small uh, observer of that story, but I really don't know how the story goes. And I know how the story starts. I'm just not sure how it ends. So let me tell it in two ways, and then maybe we can have a conversation in, in what the right conclusion to that story is of, of climate change as told by science, technology, uh, and, and policy. One way to tell the story is that it's been a wonderful life. Uh, it's absolutely been a wonderful life, and if I did have my slides, I would put up that slide from Paris. I happen to be in the room, and the, the treaty is signed, and they're all hugging and, 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 and um, sort of clapping each other on the back as if something wonderful and great has happened. Uh, and that's a story that many of us have been part of. I came to TPP uh, literally directly from the first set of climate negotiations. And then that's what I worked on here. 
which partly means it was 25 years ago, a quarter century ago, when this enterprise of doing climate policy, bringing science to the enclave of policy, to inform policy, to nudge technology, to solve this great problem, was initiated. Right? Some of you would remember the word of Rio, 92. Before that, this had happened two years. Before that, the, 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 the negotiation on climate had changed, had, had started. And one way to tell that is that a lot has changed. I mean, there are across the country, not just classes, there are programs, there are schools, there are departments that talk about climate change. Climate change in many ways has become the, or one of the big frameworks in which policy on anything happens. You can't talk about business without talking about it. You can't talk about politics without talking about it. So one way to tell the story is, here is an issue more than any other I can think of where the science technology policy nexus has been a virtuous cycle where each of those has expanded because of the other, at least in the activity. It has become a major political issue. 153 heads of state do not go to Paris would not have gone to Paris 25 years ago. Uh, John Kerry would not have canceled his flight and said, I'm going to stay here until this is done. So you can tell the story by way of, we really pushed this issue to the center of not just policy, but politics in this great way that has not been true of most other things. Not just, not, just, uh, not just center of policy, we did it in a particular way. We said we will do science, the IPCC, that will push policy, bring it up. That will push, create the conditions for technology, the changes in technology that Ken talked about, the uh, drop in the price of solar, and so on and so forth. These are not, unlike in other areas, I would argue, purely market-driven phenomena. These are partly policy-driven phenomena, where policy was partly driven by that science uh, of coming from IPCC and others. I've been part of the IPCC, at least in the three cycles, but I'll come to this in a minute. So that's one way to tell the story, that it's been a wonderful life. We actually have placed this issue at the center of politics in a way that one could not have imagined. Uh, I'll give one other example of this. Right from here, I started teaching at Boston University uh, and was kind of hired in the Department of International Relations to teach international relations and environmental policy. I developed my first course. I called it Sustainable Development. And the way the process works there, the course then has to go to a university committee where other departments have to sort of approve of it, that you aren't trampling on anyone's feet. So I send my syllabus, and out comes the result from the committee that your, there is a serious objection on your syllabus. Uh, the Department of Economics uh, believes that this course should not be taught because its title is development. And the person teaching it has no knowledge of economics because most of the readings are about environment. And by the way, there is no such thing as sustainable development. So, so this is 20-some this is years ago. I come back. Luckily, MIT had trained me well. So rather than pick, take, you know, one of the things I had learned is you do not argue with economists. <laughs> not, not, not unless you have too much spare time. Uh, so I said, you know, you're right. I will redo my syllabus. True story. And I redid my syllabus. And the only change I made was I changed the title to Environmentally Sustainable Development. <laughs> it passed through the committee in five minutes. 20 years on, uh, there are now four sections of that course. I no longer teach it, but there's a lottery to get, get in. Part of that is, again, part of this wonderful life. That something like sustainable development that your colleagues would think do not even deserve a course becomes actually a centerpiece uh, at least one of the centerpiece of what is now a school, right? So that's one way to tell the story. I'm sorry I've taken too long, but there's another way to tell the story. And the other way to tell the story is, boy, did we fail. Boy, did we fail. Yesterday, India, which, is, which, is, which knows a bit about hot weather, recorded its hottest ever recorded day. 51 degrees centigrade, 124 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a pleasant day. So enjoy that while you have. 
Uh, right now, there's a massive heat wave. Uh, to, last month, 600 people died in a flood in Pakistan. The only newsworthy part of that is this is the sixth consecutive year of that flood. And it's now kind of become routine. There's a ninth consecutive year of a drought in the same country. And you can go on and on. And you can take the same picture from Paris and put it up and said, boy, it took them 25 years of negotiation to come up with a treaty that has no implementable clause. There is nothing in that treaty that can possibly be implemented. You in your slide again put the two degree centigrade. Last week I was in the Seychelles, a uh, uh, wonderful, beautiful place. I was there to give the keynote address to the fourth biennial uh, summit of small states. There is such a thing. There are 53 countries, uh, all less than 1.5 uh, million people each. Uh, 34 of them had their heads of states there. And frankly, this is existential for them. By the way, the Maldives person said that the previous week, six islands had disappeared. The country had actually lost territory. Doesn't make news. They are waiting for 1.5, and it broke my heart to say to them, there is no way in any science that the 1.5 statement made at Paris can conceivably be achieved given what we are doing, or rather not doing. There is a sentence in that treaty that there will be $100 billion uh, a year. Uh, just to, to give them some solace, I just put on, on the screen what $100 billion looks like so that people know at least how many zeros there are, because no one is going to see that money ever. <laughs> right? I'm being cynical, but you can, at my age, step back and say, I spent a quarter of a century having started on this journey with the actual assumption that we will lick the problem. And not only did we fail, but I get the sense from my students, and I love my students, that this generation has given up even on the idea of licking the problem, maybe managing it. Part of me is still hopeful. I do think technology and others will help us do a lot of things. There's wonderful things happening in renewables. But we have given up on the idea, or we've given in to the idea that they're going to be massive losers. Because partly we've figured out we are not going to be those losers. Those losers are going to be in the Seychelles, they're going to be in the Maldives, they're going to be in Vanuatu. And that's the trade-off we are now kind of comfortable with, because that's what two degrees means. That's what 3.5 degree means, right? The fact we talked about earlier that you know, there are three big things, Mitigation, adaptation, and the silly, I'm sorry, geoengineering, right? Uh, so, sorry, sorry, yeah. uh, you know my views on geoengineering. But here's the point. I'm, I'm not being facetious. I'm not being facetious. We were never supposed to be talking about adaptation and geoengineering. The fact that we study, I study adaptation is a failure of a giant generation of policy, technology, science professionals to have met the challenge they had set for themselves, which was that we had caught the problem early enough and we would solve it with essentially mitigation. So the moment you start talking about adaptation, you're saying, OK, at some level, some of this is going to happen. Once you start talking about geoengineering, you're essentially given into the fact, not at some level, but at some very big level. <laughs> This is not only going to be happen, but we'll have to mess around at a planetary scale to even try to solve this. I shall, I shall end right there. I don't know how the story ends. Uh, I hope, I hope that when we meet for the 50th or the 70th, I was here for the 30th, uh, that, that, that we are more confident that the story can end in a better way. Let me end with this thought. I think, I think both stories are correct. There is a lot to be proud of in having linked technology policy and science in ways that pushed this in the right direction. Let me say where we failed. I think, and you would have got this from my subtext, I think where we failed in the policy side and in the teaching of the policy side, less here than other places, was in having not given enough attention to the justice and morality argument of policy as it relates to technology. 
for most part, most of our understanding, teaching, practice of policy was reduced to economic analysis. I think I was lucky. I think those of us who were here at MIT were luckier than others because we had Nick Ashford. We had John Ehrenfeld. Even in the system analysis class, we could talk about the politics of airports and figure out that it wasn't just about the length of the, of the runway. It was about who's getting displaced. But for most part in our teaching of technology and policy, I think the missing link still remains. Giving our students that deep, real, visceral understanding that these are essentially issues of long-term morality. And that is, I think, where we have not done a good job. Thank you very much. I think, uh, thank you very much, Adil. You did not disappoint at all. Uh, and you ended with exactly the place I would have liked to end up, questions of justice and morality. Uh, I do think, though, I mean, I, I, I want to open it up, but I, I do want to make the point that in, in the end, uh, and part of the morning conversation was also this, about the role of folks or policy analysts in the political process. Because in the end, uh, I think, you know, part, part of this question with the missing angles of ethics and justice and so on, it's really as much a political thing as a policy analyst job. So it, in a sense, it's, it's, while I think it's important for policy analysts to be thinking about this, it's also uh, really a, a, a question, a larger question for the whole political community. In fact, I would say in, in, in the climate, international climate policy making, it's really the politicians who've not paid any attention to that. Sure. There certainly have been enough analysts talking about that. But I think um, I do have some more thoughts, but I, I actually want to open it up right now for, for um, uh, people in the audience. And then I think we'll come back in the last few minutes and kind of wrap it up and think about what all of this might mean for uh, TPP as it looks forward. So um, we're open to questions. Unless Adil has depressed you so much that <laughs> <laughs> there's one over there in the back. Uh, so, Adil and Ken, uh, uh, one of the things you didn't raise, uh, you raised the climate context, but uh, there is a broader sustainable development agenda that was adopted by 180 countries in September and sets out a broad set of goals. There's also a technology facilitation mechanism. So I'm just curious if uh, you see that as, as being a agreement by politicians uh, to do more than they have done under the uh, climate agreement, um, and whether you see any opportunity there to kind of address some of the um, integration and, and you know inequity issues that you've alluded to. One of the the sad things is that in the last year, in working with ministries at at the ministries of water, ministries of ag, environment, the, the SDGs have not come up once. They are much more at the higher level. I think on the ground, it's going to be some, it's some research that wider we're doing is how can we use the SDGs to develop it. But then in the same issue, the, the same, we have the same problems of conflicting SDGs in terms of energy and water supply and food. They have, we have some of those same conflicts coming up at the, at the same point. And, and that's, that's there. And, and so I don't see them becoming inculcated to the, the, the technology side yet. And it needs to be. And, and bringing what that means. And so I, we, we haven't seen it at that level, but at, at other level we've had. And then the other thing that is coming up is the whole issue of, of justice and, and equity because some of the issues of the development is a hydropower development versus irrigation development is then usually a matter of equity. And who's the receiver of these benefits of the, of the water development there? And that, that's coming a little bit more into the forefront. And then the other issue that's really playing the role is, and one of the things we're trying to use as SDGs, is in transboundary water. Um, and that, and especially when we're doing adaptation, who has the right to adapt, to adapt first? And these kinds of issues, and and there's some some other issues along there. I don't know, thinking. Uh, very briefly on that, um, this goes back to Richard Tabor's class. Actually, I 
remember writing it first Thursday. I, I haven't come up with many new ideas since I left here. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have any even while you were here. <laughs> I knew you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but here's the one. I, I have Sorry. always been uncomfortable with the word sustainability as a surrogate for sustainable development. Uh, I think right. people are well-meaning, but I think those are right. two very different concepts. And if you look around your, uh, around you know things you read and stuff, uh, unfortunately, we talk about sustainable development less and less, and sustainability more and more. I've got nothing against sustainability, but empirically, I can do sustainability uh, fairly easy. Very large numbers of populations just are made to die somehow, and a lot of things will stabilize for a while. Because sustainability does not embed in it any concept of inequity or injustice. So you mean environmental sustainability? When you environment, say that? yeah. Right. yeah. Just so, and sustainable yeah. development, part of the discomfort mm -hmm. of the development there was that it put this equity question very upfront and central, right? It's very much like land use planning in other sorts of ways. Uh, sustainability can be engineering, in an engineering way, be optimized uh, in, in all sorts of ways, some of which are just and some of which are not. So, so I, I think the fact that we talk less about sustainable development including in developing countries, is rather sad. But it's not as if it's gone away. You are right. A lot of good things have happened. And a lot of good things have happened because of technology and because countries have taken on this agenda. But I do think there is uh, that trade-off. Part of the trade-off also is that while I think those of us who, who work uh, in this area have had major success in making um, climate, and I'm again coming back to climate, a policy issue. Part of the bargain has been that the political class, as Ambuj put it, has also played us and turned us into political narrative operators. And in some ways, I would prefer those who are on the expert side to have more distance with policy. And, and you see this, for example, in how some of, sometimes those of us doing the science become very eager to make the political argument about what is politically feasible or not. And you see this a lot in, in so I served on the IPCC, uh, three IPCCs, and the fourth time, the last report, I sort of uh, stepped out. I resigned, not because I, 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 I had anything against them, these are my friends, but I had just come to the realization this was now busy work. Uh, it wasn't really adding any value, or at least I wasn't adding too much value to what the original idea was, which is that science will inform policy, and then policy will do the messy work, not science. That distinction sometimes I fear about who's supposed to do the messy work uh, has, has blurred in this process. And I think for the younger practitioners there, one should always be very careful on where that line is. Because if you cross over to the other side, it's not very easy to enter back. I, I'll add uh, one point about your question of the technology facilitation mechanism. And I think it's, it's actually important because at least it helped me understand the role of uh, technology policy analysts. So I was actually working with the UN division that was leading that process. And uh, I was very much part of the, of the, the various um, open working group meetings on this. In fact, they asked me to put together uh, some uh, way of thinking about international cooperation to facilitate technological, um, uh, to facilitate te te technologies in order to help us meet these SDGs. And I actually worked with, actually another uh, person of Indian origin who was the first head of ARPA-E, and we came together you know, using his experience from ARPA-E to think about how could we accelerate technological change, direct it in the right directions to address these different goals. And we wrote this kind of Spent a lot of time thinking about the design of this mechanism. Uh, and you know, lo and behold, at, at the UN, at, at, the, at the General Assembly conversations, there was no real interest in that idea at all. I mean, it was real politics, I think, unfortunately, and I think this picks up on what Adil was saying earlier. Uh, the international politics of climate change or the international politics of sustainable development are such that there's really no appetite for working together anymore. Uh, and not on the part of developing countries. Developing countries do understand the importance of technology, technology and the ability of technology to meet these goals. But I think the industrialized countries have really kind of, in a sense, it's, they're in a very different place now than they were 25 years ago when uh, the UN Conference on Environment and Development happened uh, in Rio. So I think it's, 
uh, it's, it's a little bit sobering in that, you know, as technology policy analysts, you think about how to think about questions relating to technology and how to think about uh, approaches and policies in order to achieve certain goals. And then you realize that in order to actually get things done, the political process really reigns supreme. And part of the question for me in going back to India, I think not just on SDGs but other areas, I think part of the understanding has become that as somebody who thinks about the, how to do more with technology, using slightly more creative policies, uh, you really have to engage in the political process. Uh, I think whether domestically or internationally, I think it's, it's absolutely key. And the TFM, the Technology Facilitation Mechanism, is a perfect example of this, where really all the potential of technology, uh, in a sense, sits there. But the mechanism really is, if you, look at the, if you look at what they're doing, it's really kind of toothless. They basically said the TFM is basically, its job is to figure out what's going on across the UN all the UN agencies, and to do a little bit of coordination. Right? Effectively, it's saying that a little bit of synergy is going to solve all problems, whereas the problems, whether climate or health or energy, are enormous enough that, I mean, if you look at the SDGs, the, the, the 17 goals, I mean, they're really daunting. And so it, it's very clear that if you want to address those goals, technology is going to have to be, if it is a, a part of the solution, it's going to have to do much more. And how to do that, I think, becomes really uh, not just a policy, uh, you know, policy analyst question, but it's really a, a political question. Anyway, anybody else? Uh, somebody else had their hand up there. Yeah. So, so part of the challenge is that we, we, we accept that climate change is a serious issue, and yet the political discussion in this country is still questioning whether or not this is just a liberal hoax and an income redistribution challenge. And you know, so we see no. No, no belief in the science and no willingness to pay for it, e even if they accept the science. And so it sort of left to the question, what, what does a technologist do with this? If you can't convince people there's a problem, forget about paying for it. So let, let me just answer two, two parts. And this is an African from the last three or four years perspective. Uh, one of the problems is there are a lot of funders who are willing to deal with climate change in 2100, but not poverty now. And fortunately, we don't have a moral dilemma because climate resilience for a change in 2100 is exactly what we need to do for climate variability now and keeps me sane. Otherwise, it would be a moral dilemma. The other interesting thing is in Africa, there is a dearth of um, TPP type students or trained people. We get very well-trained scientists who go, go back and then are. So in the African Climate, Pol African Climate Policy Center in Addis, which is the, the African Union and also the um, uh, UNECA, UN, ECA, that group, they have PhDs in climate science or climate modelers brought in to do climate policy and then leave without a, after a year. Because their solution to everything is to downscale to one eighth by one eighth degree. Then, then we'll, when we can make policy science when we have good models. And then they leave because they're frustrated and nothing happens in this, in this area. And it's meetings, meetings, meetings. So this issue of bringing and partnering with African institutions or fellowships or however we do it to, to get this technology policy um, community built in Africa is a real important activity. I think it needs to go on. How, I'm not sure yet. But, but that's something issue. And also this disconnect between sustainable development now and climate change in the future and where the money's going. So um, I was a contemporary of Ambush and a deal back in the early 90s. I did a master's at, in TPP and um, I remember there was this mantra, or maybe it was a bromide, that said something like, you know, in terms of the developed world and the developing world, you know, we would always think uh, and talk about, well, you know, what's going to happen when everyone in the developing world, you know, owns cars to the degree we do in the U.S.? I mean, we are totally screwed at that point. And then we'd say, well, you know, it's not fair, just, equitable for us to think that we would deprive the develop, developing world of car ownership to that degree or air conditioners or whatever. But then we would say, um, but really what we want to do is we want them to have good transportation systems and so forth, but we want you know, 
them to be able to sort of leapfrog. This was kind of the term of art I remember back then. Um, we want them to have the, you know, the better technologies and to skip over the kind of nasty, polluting, inefficient technologies that we've used here. So that would kind of make us feel better, I remember. Um, that's, you know, 22, 23 years ago. I mean, what, can you reflect on that? What has happened? Have we seen any of that? Is there a chance of that? Um, any thoughts? <laughs> Does this ring true for anybody? I just remember this term leapfrog. We were leapfrogging a lot back in the early 90s. Uh, you know, both of those are great questions. And when someone says that's a great question, that means they have no idea what the answer is. Uh, <laughs> So in that spirit, but, but I, I know, thank you for asking that. I, I know exactly the conversation, right? It would usually happen in Au Bon Pain. Yeah. Uh, and it would usually happen right after the morning pro seminar. And Nick maybe would say, uh, what if every Chinese had a fridge? And I would get angry and say, the Chinese need a fridge more than guys in Maine. And, uh, and then we would have our croissant. Uh, uh, <laughs> so... But the fact of the matter is a lot, I mean, there is good news. A lot of leapfrogging did happen, right? There's rapid bus transit, that is, there, there are ideas that are coming from, from, uh, from, from Latin America and going to Lahore and just skipping Boston mm -hmm. in the way. And, and there is a lot of these things, and we have matured. Some of that naivety has gone. I wish it hadn't, but it has. Uh, and uh, so, so it's not as if nothing has happened, but I think that where, where, where I worry about is that the limits of leapfrogging, we have not fully recognized. This goes back to your very uh, good earlier question. Uh, you know, back in the 80s, I have a slide that usually shows this better, but let me try to tell the story. Back in, this is a very high order sort of uh, schema. Back in the 80s, the general sense was, government is the solution. Business is the problem. The nonprofits is who are going to push advocates, right? Government is the solution, you need an EPA, you need treaties, you need UN. All your solutions were that. You come to the 90s, and the general sense is, business is still the problem. I remember writing a review of the WBCSD, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. The last sentence of the review was, can you wear Birkenstock with pinstripe? Maybe, but not yet. Uh, the business was still seen as, you know, go back to 92, Rio, business was sort of off the thing. That they were the ones who were supposed to be reformed. Uh, government was no longer seen as the solution. The NGOs, Muhammad Yunus is going to save the world. The magic of nonprofits is going to transform the world. You come to the 2000s, and at least when I go back to my classes at that time, the world had changed again. Government was clearly the problem. Business was clearly the solution. Bill Gates is going to save the world. And NGOs now are facilitators, which really means they'll work with business to make this happen. Right? In some ways, I once told this to the late Morris Strong, and he said, if you go back 40 years, you'll see the same cycle going again and again. And so we keep going in this cycle. Part of it, I think, is there is this sense that somehow we can we can resolve this without making the tough individual change. That somehow, we, we again have this false faith in, in technology. I'm not saying technology can't deliver, but I think we are pushing technology too hard as if I will have to change nothing of my lifestyle, but simply by Musk doing something on my roof with his solar panels, the world will become a better place because I drive a Prius and have solar panels on my roof. And I think the world does become a better place by both those acts. But part of it is you know, that, that sort of anger that had the leapfrogging conversation. I sometimes feel we've kind of given up on it. And we've, I don't hear too much conversation that you will have to. There is no way to lick this problem without at least some fundamental individual change that's not going to be comfortable for everyone. classic example, it's the cell phone, right? But if, if you look at, for any new technology, you know, the early stages are really the expensive stages, both in terms of the cost of the technology, but also the cost of experimentation. So in the case of cell phones, all of that happened in the industrial world. 
So by the time cell phones became the classic leapfrog answer for developing countries, the prices had already driven down. The technology had, had gone way down the, you know, the learning curve and all of that. In the area of climate and health and all of that, if you were, if you were, if you were serious about leapfrogging, what it really meant is the industrialized world saying, we are going to help share the costs of the leapfrogging. I mean, so if you look at the climate convention, this notion of the incremental cost is effectively saying that if you want to go to more advanced technologies, we understand they are more expensive, and we are going to help bear the cost of that, experimentation, so to speak, right? That agreement has fallen apart. I mean, that's the point I was making earlier. So it's impossible for developing countries to leapfrog by themselves. They have neither the technical capabilities nor the financial capabilities. So it's not that leapfrogging is not possible in principle. It's just that leapfrogging requires a different forms of working together. In the, in the cell phone world, it, didn't, it wasn't working together. Actually, the markets in the industrialized world drove down the prices and advanced the technology enough that it just automatically became possible there. Right? And then the explosion of the cell phones in developing countries drove down prices so much that you really could diffuse them everywhere. But that's not the answer with many other technologies. So I think, well, it's not that leapfrogging is not possible in principle. It really does require some more careful thinking about how to do that strategically. It requires strategy if you want to do it in a certain, certain time frame to meet certain goals. And it requires cooperation at a different, at a different scale. So Matt, you had a point. Um, a question and a comment. Uh, question has to do with, you were emphasizing uh, justice and morality, and it, the question is sort of how do we integrate that into technology and policy education? How do we teach people about how to think about those kinds of problems? One aspect of it, it seems to me, that we haven't talked a lot about is institutions and who gets to decide, and by what processes do they decide, and who has power. Uh, I mean, you, you can look at the old studies where an Office of Technology Assessment type organization does a study on what the issues are, and then you have a citizen panel do a study on what the issues are, and they're asking fundamentally different questions than even occurred to the Office of Technology Assessment uh, kinds of uh, people. So I'd be interested in that. And then the comment is uh, perhaps a somewhat cynical one. Um, you were saying the big mistake we made in climate was not emphasizing morality. I would say there are very few policymakers I've encountered who are motivated by morality one way or the other. Um, and it seems to me that um, one of the big mistakes we've made is that we emphasize the climate aspect where you're investing now for somebody else's grandchildren as opposed to the immediate co-benefits where you know, it's in the here and now for you that the benefit uh, accrues. Uh, and it seems to me that's much more motivating. If you look at the clean power plan and the economic analysis, I think more than 90% of the benefit uh, is from the reductions in fine particulates actually killing people here and now rather than from the climate benefits. Um, Uh, so I, 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 I think you're right on the time scale issue, but I would say also, but the time scale issue was very, very right. We, we simply did not understand the time scale our audience was working at, right? Uh, if you're in, what's long term if you're an economist? In the long term, we're all dead. What's long term if you're a politician? Four years max, maybe two, the next election, right? And, and, and we were telling these stories in a time scale that just did not match. Uh, our various audiences, and I, I think that's right. Uh, what do we do? Uh, I, I, I know my answer, John Ehrenfeld and Nick Ashford. Uh, we do, uh, we, 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 I, I certainly think every, every program like this ought to have courses in law, uh, which are not about regulation, but which are about the idea of justice as embodied in, 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 in law. And I think that's one of the biggest things I took from this program because there were those courses. But, but it's partly the curricular issue of, of what we teach, which is to ask, it, which is not to sort of embed a certain advocacy attitude. It is to forever ask in technology and analysis those questions of not simply are the, do the winners gain more than the losers, but to ask the question, who are the winners and who are the losers, and do we have the mechanism to transfer the resources from the one to the other? And who 
decide. Right? Yeah. right. So those are the questions where, where that line is drawn. But if I can, uh, in, in true TPP style, speak about things that I don't know anything about. Uh, no. Uh, but, but, but try to take this somewhere else. And, and also, since the name hasn't been mentioned since morning, at least since I was here, uh, Donald Trump. Um, so, uh, so the flavor of the day is everyone and their dog has to think about and possibly write an op-ed about why did Donald Trump happen. And one of the leading answers, at least this last week, was that technology had a role to play with it. Right? And I think they are right. right? And people mean various things about it. When they say that, they mean Twitter, they mean social media, they mean Apprentice. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, but, but I think there is something to it. And what I mean by this is that the technology analyst cannot simply be a cheerleader for technology. And particularly in the IT arena, I think we've become that. The technologist can. But if we are really policy uh, practitioners, then we have someone has to ask those questions. What do I mean by Donald Trump here? There used to be a company called Blockbuster, remember? And now there's a company called Netflix. Blockbuster employed 68,000 people. Netflix employs 2,400 people. I think Netflix had something to do with Donald Trump. Not just because you can see Apprentice on Netflix, but part of that anger comes from technology after technology, app after app, the ones that we were cheerleading. The, one of the biggest mechanisms of disruption and added value was taking away jobs from a lot of people. Now, I, I know this is a facetious argument, and this is a much more, more complex than that. But what I'm saying is that type of conversation in technology policy through this rise of the IT world has been mostly missing. It's been mostly the wonderness of being able to you know, get pizza on my Apple, uh, rather than sort of looking at that societal impact of it. I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but whether it is Uber, whether it is Netflix, there's a company called Google, now called Alphabet. Its uh, market cap is about 80% more than GE. It employs one eighth the number of people that GE does. That has to have a societal impact. Someone out there has to have a conversation on what happens to society when the technology comes in. Now, maybe I was reading the wrong thing, but that conversation was likely missing. So I think we're sorry. I yeah, just want to add one, one thing. Time, we're so. we're we're focusing again yeah. on the industrialized world. Right. And I, and I want to go back yeah. and expand technology to infrastructure and society. And if Jim is there, it, I'm, I'm worried about urbanization. Because you can't leapfrog if you bring everybody together. And so how do we keep a new paradigm for urbanization? And one of the issues is if you double the yields on, by irrigation, people now go from $2 a day to $4 a day. It's still not enough to send their kids to school. So there's this drawing to the urban side for jobs and industry. And how do we solve that? And how do we work on that? And how do we pay for the infrastructure so we don't have the, the environmental unsustainability and the pollution when we're there? So I don't know that answer. I mean, that's where I see it for, for that part. And we, there's sort of two technologies, and they're both important. But there, there are different scales and different issues. But we have to work on both of them. Okay. Um, I, th I want to just end up say a couple of last comments at the end. And I think because in, in some sense, part of the, today's conversation is really thinking about uh, the future of TPP. I mean, we are celebrating the last 40 years, but also thinking about the future of TPP. And I want to go back to the title of, 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 our, of our panel, which is Technology Development and Sustainability. And one of the questions for me would be for, you know, what might be a role of TPP in this kind of a process? Uh, I think any of us who work in developing countries on questions of technology really understand the importance of building local capacity uh, to engage with questions of technological change. Uh, place like TPP and so on, lots of graduates here, lots of efforts at thinking about these kind of questions. I think the question I would like to put in front of uh, uh, TPP and, and colleagues at MIT is, what might be the role of programs such as this to help build uh, local capacity? People talked about the fact that context matters. Well, if context matters, then local capacity matters. And, and then the question becomes, how do you think about, how does one think about building this kind of local capacity in some kind of a cooperative uh, mode? I mean, you know, I was, I, I was just reading MIT's launched a campaign 
for a better world. And as part of that, it's, it's going to raise $5 billion. So I wrote, a, I wrote an email to a colleague here and said, you know, that's really great. You know, you're, you're launching a campaign for a better world. You should think about how you're going to work with developing countries on this. You know, and maybe some of that money could, use, could be used to build capacity there. Because if you're building a better world, you can't do it without building capacity locally. And he wrote back to me and he said, well, you really don't understand how this process works. <laughs> <laughs> that money is not counted as money raised if it doesn't stay here. Right? I mean, so I, I think in a sense, you know, we we're talking earlier about this notion of teamwork as a way to solve problems. And I'd like actually maybe TPP and MIT to think about what does teamwork mean if we're thinking about questions of technology development and sustainability in developing countries where some of these questions are urgent, but the capacity doesn't exist, the resources doesn't exist. Uh, and I think it's a great, I mean, so I'm, not, I'm actually not saying this negatively at all. I think it's a great opportunity to work together in ways that actually make an impact and to pick up on what Adil said 20 years from now or whatever, 10, 20 years from now when we meet again, maybe we're going to be saying, well, in the last 20 years, TPP actually took the lead in building international partnerships, in working together with colleagues across the developing world, uh, which, by the way, the Tata Center for Technology and Design is doing in a very interesting way, at least for India. Uh, and I think it, it's, 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 it's a model, but it's a model focused mostly on questions of purely technology and design. I think I was telling Noel that TPP actually is a nice possible complement to that. Uh, and I'm actually talking to some folks at that center about in thinking about these very issues. But I do think there's an opportunity to do some very interesting things. You know, people talk about the fact that a crisis is an, op is an opportunity. And I think for academics it is. This crisis is an opportunity for us to engage in the process in different ways and maybe think creatively about jointly uh, thinking about how to address those problems. So I'd like to actually kind of just, from my side at least, leave that as a bit of, a, of, an, of an issue on the table and maybe even a challenge to the MIT TPP uh, as it thinks about its future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.